Good morning. Yeah, welcome. We gather this day and uh, we begin with the confession and forgiveness. I know lately we've been beginning with a song, so a little different today, uh, but I invite you to turn to the confession and forgiveness. You can remain seated, uh, but join in the confession and forgiveness found on page one. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God, whose teaching is life, whose presence is sure, and whose love is endless. Amen. Amen. Let us confess our sins to the one who welcomes us with an open heart. God, our comforter, like lost sheep we have gone astray. We gaze upon abundance and see scarcity. We turn our faces away from injustice and oppression. We exploit the earth with our apathy and greed. Free us from our sin, gracious God. Listen when we call out to you for help. Lead us by your love to love our neighbors as ourselves. Amen. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. By the gift of grace in Christ Jesus, God makes you righteous. Receive with glad hearts the forgiveness of all your sins. Amen. I invite you to stand and to join in the gathering hymn. There's a wideness in God's mercy like the wideness of the sea there's a kindness in his justice which is more than liberty there is no place where our sorrows are more felt than in him there is no place where our failings have such kindly judgment given there is welcome for the sinner and a promise grace made good there is mercy with a savior there is healing in his blood there is grace enough for thousands of new worlds as great as this there is room for fresh creations in the And the measures of our mind And the heart of the eternal Is most wonderfully kind There is plentiful redemption In the blood that has been shed There is joy for all the members In the sorrows of the is not all we owe to Jesus, it is something more than all. Greater good because of evil, larger mercy through the fall. If our love were but more simple, we should take The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And also with you. Please be seated. Uh, welcome to worship. We gather this day uh, outdoor once again uh, with the sounds of Blue Jays. Um, we've had lots of wild turkeys around the property recently, so don't know if we'll be visited by other of God's creatures. Uh, this day in worship, and actually in this season, um, I'd invite you to pay attention to what Jesus has to share with us about discipleship. There's kind of a theme week after week in Mark that we're getting right now in the lectionary where Jesus is teaching his disciples what it means to follow him. 
Uh, the way Mark does it is the disciples are kind of bumbling fools who don't get it over and over and over again. But it gives Jesus an opportunity to teach and to re-engage uh, and to share with them and, of course, share with us in particular what it means to follow Jesus. So I invite you to be attentive to those themes. Uh, we continue in worship with the Kyrie. You can remain seated. God, you draw us to yourself and welcome us as beloved children. Help us lay aside all envy and selfish ambition that we may walk in your ways of wisdom as servants of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Amen. Join me in a responsive reading of Psalm 1. Happy are they who have not walked in the counsel of the wicked nor lingered in the way of sinners, nor sat in the seats of the scornful. Their delight is in the law of the Lord, and they meditate on God's teaching day and night. They are like trees planted by streams of water, bearing fruit in due season, with leaves that do not wither. Everything they do shall prosper. It is not so with the wicked. They are like chaff which the wind blows away. Therefore the wicked shall not stand upright when judgment comes, nor the sinner in the counsel of the righteous. For the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked shall be destroyed. A reading from the book of James. 
Who is wise and understanding among you? Show by your good life that your works are done with gentleness, born of wisdom. But if you have bitter envy and selfish ambition in your hearts, do not be boastful and false to the truth. Such wisdom does not come down from above, but is earthly, unspiritual, unspiritual, devilish. For where there is envy and selfish ambition, there will also be disorder and wickedness of every kind. But the wisdom from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, willing to yield, full of mercy and good fruits, without a trace of partiality or hypocrisy. And a harvest of righteousness is sown in peace for those who make peace. Those conflicts and disputes among you, where do they come from? Do they not come from your cravings that are at war within you? You want something and do not have it, so you commit murder. And you covet something and cannot obtain it, so you engage in disputes and conflicts. You do not have because you do not ask. You ask and do not receive because you ask wrongly, in order to spend what you get on your pleasures. Submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Word of God, word of life. Thanks be to God. Gospel according to Mark. Glory, Glory to, to you, you, O Lord. Lord. Jesus and his disciples went on and passed through Galilee. He did not want anyone to know it, for he was teaching his disciples, saying to them, The Son of Man is to be betrayed into human hands, and they will kill him, and three days after being killed he will rise again. But they did not understand what he was saying and were afraid to ask him. Then they came to Capernaum, and when he was in the house, he asked them, What were you arguing about on the way? But they were silent, for on the way they had argued with one another who was the greatest. He sat down, called the twelve, and said to them, Whoever wants to be first must be last of all and servant of all. Then he took a little child and put it among them, and taking it in his arms, he said to them, Whoever welcomes one such child in my name welcomes me. And whoever welcomes me welcomes not me, but the one who sent me. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise, Praise to you, O Christ. Christ. Grace and peace to you from Jesus Christ, the one who disrupts us and frees us to live a new life. Jesus' disciple Simon Peter is reported to have had a house in this town of Capernaum. And as we're listening in the Gospel of Mark, after walking together all day, Jesus and his disciples stop and enter a house. They stop for a rest. Jesus uses this moment of rest to ask his followers a question. What were you arguing about on the way. Unsurprisingly, the disciples were silent, for on the way they had argued with one another about who was the greatest. This is part of a repeating pattern in the Gospel of Mark. Repeatedly, Jesus teaches his disciples that he will be betrayed and murdered and will rise again. And repeatedly, the disciples fail to understand or to accept Jesus' teaching. <clears throat> they argue with Jesus, and 
They argue with one another. And each time, Jesus takes it as an opportunity. An opportunity to correct them and to teach them something about discipleship. The lesson from Jesus today is deceptively simple. The gospel says that Jesus took a little child and he put it among them. He held that child in his arms and he said, whoever welcomes one such child in my name welcomes me. And whoever welcomes me welcomes not me, but the one who sent me. For our own understanding, I think it's helpful for us to know that this word that Jesus uses for little child was also commonly used in the ancient world for a slave or a servant. Jesus clearly has this double meaning in mind. To be servant of all is very much like being a little child. No status, no power, no one to look down upon. For us, this is the question to take into our heads and into our hearts. How is following Jesus the same as welcoming a little child? How is following Jesus like welcoming a little child? How does opening our arms to the powerless lead us to the resurrection where human weakness becomes the very power of God, where the last become first? Jesus tells us that when we welcome the powerless child, we embrace the very kingdom of God. Perhaps this is the very best argument I've ever heard for including the rodeo that we call a children's sermon in worship. Children are unpredictable. I don't know if you've noticed that. And they disrupt the well-laid plans and programs that adults have in mind. They don't answer in the ways that you necessarily want or expect. They frustrate your attempts to bring order and they use that rope around the pastor's waist to tie him to the altar rail. I know that's pretty specific. (laughs) And this is also true outside of worship. Teachers know that working with kindergartners, especially at the start of the school year, is very much like herding feral cats. Children resist order and they don't seem to know how to fall in line. Without even trying, children disrupt these carefully laid plans of the adults who care for them and try to teach them. In 2012, I was a little league coach. I was other things as well, a parent, a pastor, a spouse. But being a little league coach that year was a surprising gift one that I still cherish today. It sounds melodramatic, but it's not an exaggeration to say that for me, being a little league coach taught me about discipleship, taught me about resurrection. Before the season began, I sat down at a bar with my fellow little league coach, Bob. We talked about expectations and we made practice plans. Bob was an experienced coach with an easygoing temperament. And working with Bob, I felt very confident about the work that we were about to do with a bunch of eight and nine-year-olds. A month and a half later, my confidence had turned into genuine frustration tinged with despair. We were at the halfway point of the season, and we had yet to win a single game, not even one. Bob and I would talk about team morale and how losing was affecting the kids, but in truth, it was about our very adult hopes and expectations. We looked around at the other coaches in the league, and we could not accept the notion that we would be last and least among them. You should have seen some of those guys. Listening to Jesus' words about embracing him like a child, my mind jumps back to those many Little League losses. I remember being confused by the mindset of eight and nine-year-olds. They were still too young to feel the weight of each loss. And to be honest, they were completely delusional. When we lost by more than 10 runs, they would look at me and they would smile and say, that was a close one, coach. And when we actually lost a close one, they would look at me with complete sincerity and say, 
That was a great win. Their belief wasn't logical, but it was an undeniable force. I looked at our team ranking as last in the league, and these children's ridiculous belief would push back against my adult frustrations and my disappointments. The first and most obvious lesson that I learned from little leaguers was about fun. They were clearly having more fun than I was. And that fun was all about having very short memories. They enjoyed competition in the moment, but they had no desire to keep track of it from game to game. They would simply forget about the failures of the last inning or the last week, and they would move on, bright-eyed and hopeful. Hope springs eternal in the green fields of the imagination. While I was stuck on the past, they were enjoying the sunshine. They were looking forward to all the fun to come. I think this is part of what Jesus means when he tells his disciples to receive him like a child. He is saying that they must open up fully to God in the present moment. They must not be held back by their past. They must have the youthful optimism of a child. Now it's true that Jesus is not talking about a little game. He is talking about following him to places of rejection and death and resurrection. Our adult minds react like Peter and the other disciples. We're tracking all those wins and losses in our heads. We don't want to be on a team that's headed for failure. But this is where our adult thinking betrays us. This is where our adult thinking needs to be disrupted. Jesus teaches us that our scorekeeping is all wrong. We have placed first things last and last things first. To see if we are winning in life, we check our attendance numbers and our bank accounts. But Jesus tells us again and again that he has no interest in these things. God's scorekeeping is different than human scorekeeping. And just like with those little leaguers, God's scorekeeping is free of human worry. It's a lot more fun. But there's more. Following Jesus is about more than living without stress. It's about more than just enjoying the game of life. Though we have difficulty hearing it, Jesus is teaching us that beyond rejection and death, that he will also experience resurrection. Using that Little League metaphor, we could say that beyond all the ups and downs of the long season, the love of God is victorious in the end. In the resurrection, God conquers all. Huddling up with Coach Bob at that midway point, I had given up on the idea of a winning season. I was even beginning to wonder if we would experience the relief of winning a single game. The losing wasn't all bad. It did teach us humility. When we found that we could not control wins and losses, what happened in the games, we turned our attention to having good practices, to building up team morale. And to my surprise, coaching this way was actually more fun. The uniqueness of each child became clear to me. Their joy rubbed off on me. The contagious energy of eight And nine-year-olds, little by little, began to pull me in. The second half of that Little League season was different. The coaches not only relaxed and had more fun, but surprise, surprise, we also started winning some games. And at the end of the season, all the teams were entered into a championship tournament. And the story played out just like a movie script. We went from last to first and we did it in the best possible way we won games because these kids had somehow learned to play together they had grown not only individually in skills but together in teamwork and trust i still remember the moment when a kid on our team caught a crucial late game game saving fly ball before the season this child had never played baseball His family moved from India, 
And his dad would confuse me over and over again as he tried to explain cricket to me. This child could not hit, he could not catch, and he didn't understand most of the rules. When Jesus says, the last shall be first, this is the little leaguer that I have in mind. But as they say, miracles happen. Late in the game during the championship tournament, this same child focused and he calmly settled under a fly ball. And that ball settled in his glove without a bobble and without a flinch. It was not an accident. It was not a fluke. It was not lucky, but it was a kind of miracle. After that game, teammates hugged him and he smiled from ear to ear. Maybe it's a little dramatic, but for me, that was absolutely a resurrection moment. A miracle where we are drawn together and the last truly become first. This is the second lesson that those little leaguers taught me. Beyond the fun, embracing one another as a child leads us to true victory. It guides us to a loving community that becomes a conquering, victorious community. Words like victory and conquering don't sound quite right because they have been poisoned. To adult ears hardened by years of hurt, these are selfish and violent words. But God's victory is different. It is the victory of life over death. It is Christ's victory of love over all those hurts that divide. It is the belief that allows a community to persevere through hard times with joy and to somehow become stronger in the process. The final game of that Little League season was absolutely ridiculous. After letting go of the idea of winning a single game, Coach Bob and I were in the championship game. And the ABC television station in Seattle, Como 4, was there with video cameras doing pregame interviews and taking video throughout. They had a weekly segment called Eric's Little Heroes that featured kids on the evening news. Our little leaguers did not seem nervous and they were not surprised by all the attention. Why wouldn't they be on television? They believed in themselves. They were losing by double digits and they believed in one another now. When that game ended, the kids danced around the diamond and they tackled each other with screams of joy. In their own minds and in the minds of the adults keeping score, they had won. On the evening news, their victory was replayed for everyone in the Seattle area to see. Stories of childhood like this one are fun, but they have the power to be more than just a nostalgic distraction. They can actually help teach us about what it means to receive Jesus like a child. Children embrace life with sincere belief and without that weight of all the past failures. They don't play by adult rules that have already decided who the winners and losers are likely to be. That childish belief and optimism matters. It builds community and opens us up to resurrection beyond all the failures we have known. Remember the child from India on my little league team Remember how in a small miracle he went from least on the team, unable to catch a ball, to first where he calmly caught that fly ball in a crucial game. That victory was only possible because there were coaches and other players on his team that welcomed him, that received the gifts he had to share. They believed in him. They were rewarded. It's the same in church community. When we open our hearts and our minds to children and to immigrants and to others who are dismissed as having less to offer, we open our lives to unexpected miracles. We open our lives to God. God's victory in our community depends on our openness to the last who in God will become first. In the end, we cannot predict what resurrection, what success in our church community looks like. It is God's doing. But thanks be to God, we can receive the teaching of Jesus. We can listen as he tries desperately to help us understand. 
we can receive the vulnerable and the marginalized and learn to see these little ones as God does. We can stop keeping score like adults and let the children teach us how to have some fun. Think and pray and talk about what it means for your family and your community to receive Jesus like a child. Who is the last that Jesus is telling us is the first? Where do you see that childlike faith that Jesus is calling us each to embrace? Jesus sat down and he called the twelve and Jesus said to them, Whoever wants to be first must be last of all and servants of all. Then Jesus took a little child and he put it among them and taking it in his arms, he said to them, Whoever welcomes one such child in my name welcomes me. And whoever welcomes me welcomes not me, but the one who sent me. Amen. Confessing faith in the ancient words of the Apostles' Creed. The Creed is found on page 9 in your worship folder. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, Creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. May children and heirs of God's promise, we pray for the church, for the world, and for all in need. God of community, we pray for the church around the world. Unite us in our love for you. Help us overcome our divisions, that we are encouraged to work together for your sake. Lord, in your mercy, hear, hear our, our prayer. prayer. God of creation, we pray for this hurting earth. Awaken in us a new desire to care for this world and empower us to support agencies, organiza organizations, and individual efforts to heal our environment. Lord, in your mercy, hear, hear our, our prayer. prayer. God of cooperation, we pray for nations of the world embroiled in conflict. 
inspire leaders to listen to each other and work towards peaceful solutions to disagreements. Protect the vulnerable, especially children, who cannot find their home or country. Teach us how to be advocates for the justice that you desire. Lord, in your mercy, hear, hear our, our prayer. prayer. God of comfort, we pray for all who live with mental or physical illness. Help them find appropriate care. Bring healing and wholeness when the path forward seems bleak. We pause to offer up the names of those who need your healing or peace silently or aloud. Lord, in your mercy, hear, hear our, our prayer. prayer. God of compassion, we pray for the young people of this congregation. Renew us in your call to welcome the children in our midst. As they grow, strengthen their faith and our commitment to them. Lord, in your mercy, hear, hear our, our prayer. prayer. We now take time to offer up any other prayers silently or aloud. For what else do the people of God pray? Lord, in your mercy, hear, hear our, our prayer. prayer. God of consolation, we give you thanks for our loved ones who have died and pray for all who grieve. Shine your grace on all your saints. Lord, in your mercy, Hear, Hear our, our prayer. prayer. Receive these prayers, O God, and those in our hearts known only to you. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. As God is so generous with us, we too are called to be generous with the world God loves. Uh, a reminder that our cause of the month is Chil Children's Health Ministries Haiti. There's certainly information in our worship folder. Also, we want you to know that next week, we will receive uh, a guest uh, from Children's Health Ministries Haiti. He's a pediatrician, Dr. Stephen Joseph. And uh, so we'll get to find out all about their good ministry, but I invite you to be supportive of that with your offerings in this month. Uh, we receive a musical offering. <laughs>
God of mercy and grace, the eyes of all wait upon you and you open your hand in blessing. Fill us with good things at your table that we may come to the help of all in need through Jesus Christ, our Redeemer and Lord. Amen. Amen. Gathered at God's table of love and mercy, we are fed and we are forgiven and we are set free. Please join me in the celebration of Holy Communion. The Lord be with you. And And also also with you. you. Lift up your hearts. We lift lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. It is indeed right our duty and our joy that we should at all times and all places give thanks and praise to you, almighty and merciful God, through our Savior Jesus Christ, who on this day overcame death and the grave, and by his glorious resurrection opened to us the way of everlasting life. And so with all the choirs of angels, with the church on earth and the hosts of heaven, we praise your name and we join their unending hymn. Holy God, you alone are holy, you alone are God. The universe declares your praise beyond the stars, beneath the sea, within each cell, with every breath. We We praise praise you, you, O God. God. Generations bless your faithfulness through the water, by night and day, across the wilderness, out of exile, into the future. We We bless bless you, you, O God. God. We give you thanks for your dear Son at the heart of human life, near to those who suffer, beside the sinner, among the poor, with us now. We We thank thank you, O God. In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread and gave thanks, broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. After supper, he took the cup and gave thanks and gave it for all to drink, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood and it's shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. Remembering his love for us on the way, at the table, and to the end, we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ Christ has has died. died. Christ Christ is risen. risen. Christ Christ will come come again. again. We pray for the gift of your spirits in our gathering, within this meal, among your people, throughout the world. Blessing, praise, and thanks to you, holy God, through Christ Jesus, by your spirits, in your church, without end. Amen. Amen. Gathered into one by the Holy Spirit, let us pray as Jesus taught us. Our Our Father, Father, who who art in heaven, heaven, hallowed hallowed be be thy name. Thy Thy kingdom kingdom come, come, thy thy will be be done. done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. I invite you to take the bread and to eat it. This is the body of Christ given for you. Amen. I invite you to take the wine or the juice and to drink it. It's the blood of Christ shed for you. Amen. (coughs) 
O God, as a mother comforts her child, so you comfort your people, carrying us in your arms and satisfying us with this food and drink, the body and blood of Christ. Send us now as your disciples, announcing peace and proclaiming that the reign of God has come near through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Amen. The peace of Christ be with you always. And also with you. I invite you to remain where you are, but to share a word or sign of God's peace with one another. God's peace. Peace Peace be with you. God's peace be with you, Dan. Peace be with you. Yeah. I know. We have a song too, right? Yeah, we do. You okay? All right. Uh, Kim, do you want me to announce anything? You want to announce? All right, uh, Garden, as uh, most weeks is true, is available. Uh, Our little pickup station here behind uh, worship by the entrance. Please come and get some some good produce from our garden. And, of course, uh, admire its uh, continuing beauty. Um, Also, just want you to be aware, we had kind of a children and youth theme in worship with a gospel reading. Uh, It also reminds me that we have confirmations starting this week, this Wednesday evening. I want everybody to be aware of that. And also want you to know that if there are current 8th through 12th graders interested in going to the ELCA youth gathering next summer, that's next July, um, please get them in contact with me. Uh, We're gathering up those folks so we can uh, put together our group and register for that event this fall. Um, I think that's about it. Any other announcements people have? Just again, that reminder, uh, Children's Health Ministries Haiti will be here next Sunday. Uh, Invite you to be present for that. I think it'll be wonderful uh, to know more, um, not only about just the suffering and the things that folks in Haiti are going through, but also the good work of Children's Health Ministries and about the ways that God is calling us uh, to care for our brothers and sisters, not only near, uh, but also those far off. Invite you to receive God's blessing. The Lord bless you and keep you. Lord's face shine on you with grace and mercy. Lord, look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen. Let all things now living a song of thanksgiving to God the Creator triumphantly raised who fashioned and made us protected and stayed us who still guides us on to the end of our days God's banners are over us God's light goes before us a pillar of fire shining forth in the night till shadows have vanished and darkness is banished as forward we travel Serve the Lord. Thanks Thanks be to God. God.